Welcome to K-Wave 6 Radio, your show for all things positive. Welcome to K-Wave 6 Radio. This is Kirk Spencer. Today my guest is Melanie Beres. I had to get the correction on that because I was being very American on that one. Anyway, Melanie mm-hmm. is a screenwriter, she's a publisher, she's a theater professor and producer, she's a women's empowerment and relational aggression uh, coach, if you want to call it coaching, and she told me, she says, people don't know relational aggression, so it just means bullying, <laughs> she's a world-traveling journalist, and as she said it, we could go on with the list, but that's what the, she's mostly noticed for. And I just want to welcome Melanie Beres to the show. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure to have you here. We've known each other for quite some time and finally got you to do this. Well, it's only like (laughs) maybe twice, but okay. Anyway, um, I want to get into, I know we're going to talk about probably a whole lot of different topics and as we said just before we started this recording was that we, you and I could talk for, and we have done this on a couple of occasions, <laughs> for a couple hours and just go, whoa, where did the time go? So, just a bit, just a bit. Yeah. But uh, we have a lot of fun talking with each other. But you said that you wanted to talk about a particular subject. So let me give uh, one that just came to, to mind, a little preamble to it, if you will. Uh, there's a little, as you, well, you and I are good friends on Facebook as well as other places, but um, yeah. there's an expression that goes around, that's, he has been going around on Facebook, and I want you to build from there, <clears throat> excuse me, on, um, I wasn't born just to pay bills and die. And we're talking about that in relationship to how much people choose to see and choose not to see. They want to just live their life peacefully and give me what I want and everything will be just fine. Uh, don't challenge my beliefs, etc., etc. We can go on with all that. But um, also in the fact that you were talking about women are their own worst enemies. They really, truly are. And um, it doesn't, in America, take women over 200 years to get the right to vote because um, men had a whole lot to do with that. Of course, they aided in that. um, But really, our founding mothers, so to speak, often speak of how horrible they were treated mainly by women that were oppositional and I've tried to figure it out and tried to figure it out and the only thing I can think of is that it's just leftover DNA. What I mean by that is that long ago we needed the best man to protect our brood. So what was what did we need to do? We needed to take out any threatening woman. So fast forward and a lot of people have capitalized on that and today it's it's the biggest bitch wins and that's a horrible thing not only for society but our men in general because we really harm them by raising them uh, to hate women and it, it we really do whether it's through our media in, in our speech at home um, I've noticed myself I've had to catch myself because um, you know, women will really try to go after you and sabotage you, and it, and it just makes it okay for men to do the same thing. So until that feminist flag is raised, and it's the biggest elephant in the room, feminists refuse to look in the mirror at their own internalized um, uh, racism or sexualism or whatever you want to call it. Um, they refuse to look in the mirror at themselves. So let's take our, our, one of our latest or our wellest known heroes right now, which would be Gloria Steinem. She, where is she? There's still 13 states that haven't ratified um, equality for women. 
where is she still fighting for this? Um, she's not. She's running Miss Magazine, and um, it's a lot of nice fluff, but it certainly doesn't attack the root cause of women's oppression, which is women. Mm-hmm. So that's my feeling. And until women learn to get along, raise the best woman forward, um, and really bring this elephant into the room, as we can see in all the media and all the movies, what do we see? We see women attacking women. It is just the biggest selling marketing entertainment you have out there, is all these passive aggressive and aggressive covert plots against other women. So, and until that elephant is brought into the room and that feminist flag is raised that we are one and and we need to lift each other up and especially bring up baby, um, stop objectifying ourselves, nothing's going to change. And men are suffering because of it. How much do you think that this has to do with money? Um, In other words... Uh, you're talking about men and women, and yes, men love to watch cat fights. And uh, yeah, well, <laughs> back when I was in high school, long, long, long time ago, the only thing we liked about the so-called cat fights was the fact that well, we're talking about back in the '60s, was women got into these or girls got into these fights, and there was the, always the hope of the girl would get so angry she'd start ripping the other opponent's clothes off and all that kind of stuff. But nowadays, it seems to be... I mean, you can go to YouTube and just put in cat fight or girls fighting and stuff like that, and they're just fights from anywhere from high school, street fights, and wherever. So how do you think that all plays in together? Well, I really think it starts... You know, if we want to go current or if we want to go way historical, um, historically, women um, were in very much uh, empowered circles. Then religion came into play, in which they were still included in um, the circles, but again, competitiveness came into play, and that, and then religion really um, took out women. If we want to fast forward to today, or say the 80s, um, Madonna and the Madonna bots came in, and that really dumbed down society. At first, she had a very good message, you know, about sexuality, and it that it's okay, it's just, you know, why should I be a slut, and, 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 and males not, and then it just got to the point of, the women that we see on TV and the notable figures that we see on TV um, became so competitive to the point of, um, you know, if they are not psycho um, with a perfect asymmetrical face, um, they're just they're dirt. And they can't be intelligent, of course. So we don't have any notable female figures propped up in the public eye and that's been long gone and they've they've never been you know I mean we have when you see the quotes that go around on Facebook say it's always a male quote well that quote is said by probably thousands of people before that person and so on and so forth but we have so many notable women scientists doctors, adventurers, that just aren't depicted. We have very few that are depicted. And historically, in history, women aren't talked about. We have very few. They don't talk about our founding mothers. They don't talk about Abigail Adams. They don't talk about Golda Meir. They don't talk about warriors. They don't talk about anything. So what is depicted is your Madonna box. Um, young girls need to see role models in media, and there are none. And until we, until we can actually do that, until we can actually raise up the girls that are actually powerful instead of the ones that are the Madonna bots, it's not going to change. 
and it has a very adverse effect on males and young boys. And I talk to my son about it all the time. Um, he's eight. I said, so what does it feel like when you see a woman in daylight with eight inch heels on and she's probably about 50 years old, her face is stretched over her neck mm -hmm. and he's like, I don't like that mom. I don't like it. And I'm not saying that people need to be in a Habib um, or, you know, totally covered up, but there's a time and place for that kind of wear, and it's in an adult atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Now, little boys are bombarded with this all day long on magazines, on their TV commercials. And it's it just gives them an image that um, is so destructive to them. And until you know, again, once again, women learn to get along and seek out positive role models and stop watching the industry, everything. Uh, it's going to continue, and it's only going to get worse for society. And domestic violence is at an all-time high, and it's not just men; it's women too. So, and there's a reason for that, and that's what we have on the media. It's all negativity, it's all backstabbing, it's all sensationalism, and anybody you see on TV doesn't even look real. Their faces don't move. <laughs> yeah, talking heads goes to mannequins. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and then you've got media through music that teaches you what to feel, um, you know, just like the canned clapping, um, and then it's all basically violence and sexually driven. So, Speaking of sexually driven, let me ask you a question, because it's something that I th I've thought about. I haven't gone to study or research it anything, but I'm just curious, because it seems like you have the handle on this. Um, the, the what I really like in uh, is appearance for a woman doesn't matter what age is a woman who doesn't need to wear makeup and doesn't wear makeup and still looks fabulous. That's my that's my uh, definition of physically beautiful. Now there is for me that goes with emotional intelligence. Huh? Okay, I said that goes along with emotional intelligence. So that's something that's not taught in society. You're basically taught what to think, feel, and buy. Um, emotional intelligence and what real beauty is, I guess, is in the eye of the beholder. But if you are so pro passively programmed, to you create all these diseases, which is really the full spectrum of narcissism, and it's very sad. So real beauty to me is that. Is there a time and place to jazz it up? You bet. From the age of 16 to about 25, get out to those clubs. You know, do, get, get your thing on and have an Amish holiday, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And if you still want to do that, I'm all in favor of red light districts. Just keep it out of the public eye. We're always going to find what we want to find. Legalize it. If that's your thing, to be a walking disease on this planet, go for it. You're going to make somebody money. That's great. But let's just keep it out of the eye of the public. I think there should be a specialized place in every store for any kind of magazine. I don't believe in commercials. Or if you want commercials, that's fine. Then, you know, we do have things like Netflix. But all these parental controls are so hard to figure out. So it, they're still all bombarded with it. And it's just got to go back to some kind of morality and then keep keep the adult stuff separated. I'm not a prude. I like that stuff. I'd go see Madonna at an X-rated show. You might as well label her shows X-rated or Janet Jackson or any of those. I love that kind of stuff. I love burlesque. I, you know, but I don't want my kids to see it. They've got these developing brains. Your frontal lobe doesn't close to to your thirty. So, and once a child becomes twelve, they don't want to. They don't really care what their parents think. It comes about the peers and what's out in society. 
Well, we're creating narcissists that can't think for themselves because that is the, the children have to break from the parents in order to develop into their own person. True enough. But let me ask you this, though, getting back to the question. Now, as I said, I have a definition for beauty for anybody. It doesn't matter, even for a guy, not that you would call him beautiful, but... Uh, beauty is something that comes from within, but I'm talking about the physical side at this moment, which is uh, a woman that doesn't wear makeup or a very little amount of makeup, so much or so little that you cannot tell that she's wearing it. Uh, and then I find that she is, um, I find that she is physically attractive. And then you later on find out that she is. Uh, well, in this particular case, a new friend on Facebook, who, no makeup, absolutely beautiful features, and somewhere down in her files, she's taking pictures of herself, selfies, of <laughs> with her pants got down yeah. around her waist, and she's got the shirt open, showing her bra, and all this, and it's like, huh? <laughs> Well, that is, again, societal programming, and it's very sad, and once again goes back to female to female hate. I mean, if you notice the recent, and plastic surgeries have been going on since the 1930s, all the stars have been altered, t to include Marilyn Monroe, um, to the perfect symmetrical image, the tiny little pug nose and the big fat lips. Um, so that's been going on forever. It's just gotten more extreme. Um, the latest being, I guess, Uma Thurman and Renee Zellweger, who don't even look remotely like themselves. And then you even have, as young as six-year-olds, they have their 16-year-old, sweet 16, where their parents will pay for plastic surgery. Nice. Yeah. So, again, it goes back to the media. And this, this is all intentional. Mm. It's intentional. To break down society it just it truly is and it's that's not beauty but people if they're passively programmed and then they've got all this added stress of finances family and everything else that's going on and the kids don't have anything to look up to you've got this helicopter generation thanks to Oprah Winfrey and scaring us about all the crazy monsters that are going to take our children out there which just don't exist um, you know, kids uh, elaborate on that one because I don't know anything about that particular thing. But then again, uh -oh. I don't live in the country anymore. Well, <laughs> there's a reason for that, isn't there? Yes, there um, is. <laughs> so, so it's just it's extremely difficult, and it's psychological warfare on everybody, and it's there's an intentional reason for it. What what's this with the Oprah Winfrey thing that you're just talking about? Oprah Winfrey decided to, you know, live your best life, but all the talk show hosts and she was the, really the first one that came out and started to scare the public. Besides, who is the um, gentleman that lost his son? America's Most Wanted. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, I know who you're talking about. I can't think of his name. The short guy. Right, and, and personally. I'm more afraid of a man or a woman in a suit than a kid or a person on the street in a hoodie and tennis shoes. Um, so they very much scared society and, and created this society where these kids are forced to live inside. And then, of course, the, the people um, capitalized on um, video games and everything else that would keep kids fixated and focused because parents weren't all that involved in the lives of children because they had school they had their neighborhood sports teams where they could walk to of course you had your neighborhood bullies but you know you fought it out you picked it out the parents pretty much stuck together and it wasn't utopia but you still had children playing in the street and being themselves and running through trees and that was all taken away, I think, probably around 2001. Um, my daughter, who is 19 right now, 
I all of a sudden got a call for a play date. I couldn't figure out what a play date was. And it was this woman who was in my play group because I went to a play group, took parenting classes, of course, because, um, you know, it's just the thing I thought I needed. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, well, what's a play date? She's like, well, I'd like to pick up your daughter and have her come over and play with my daughter. And from then on, I was just like, well, why don't you have your daughter come over here? Um, All the kids in my neighborhood, they run around and they play together. Uh, She thought that was the most horrifying thing, and I couldn't understand that. And those of us that raised kids to, you know, we we say, all right, get, get out and play, were forced to go into the play dates. We're forced to take our kids to to basically be managers of our children, to to take them to indoor playgrounds when we have beautiful parks. I mean, they literally have indoor jumping zones for kids and playgrounds that you have to pay for. So we were helicoptered, and then you have the mommy bully rings that just got much worse. So if you didn't fit into a certain, you know, Gucci bag, um, you know, Escalade group, your your child was not allowed to be in the club. Oh, good grief. So it, it's just been a horrible thing on parents. Why was so, she so... Well, okay, I guess I might, you may have just answered my question. It's probably just a brainwashing, but... <laughs> It is. People were so afraid by Oprah and your America's Most Wanted that they wouldn't let the kids kids out how of the long, house. How long ago did that actually start with Oprah? Oh, I would say 95. Okay. It, I'm asking because I used to work, well, I used to live and work in Chicago, and there were some guys that came into a place I was working, and they were talking about they'd moved out of the city into uh, a rural area in western Michigan. Mm-hmm. And they were saying that they just noticed that even where they live, the kids don't play outside. You know, it's horrible. Yeah, we were all basically around the same age. And we were just saying, you know, we used to play outside, climb trees, we used to fall yes. out, get scratched, you know, and everything else. And parents just like, okay, cool, here, let's clean it off, let's put a bandage on it, and right. everything was fine. Right. <laughs> but nowadays, yes. you see, you don't see bicycles in the yard, you don't see kids running up and down the street. You, there, everything is inside. <laughs> well, I wasn't like that. I'm, I'm what's called a free, a free range parent. Yeah. I taught my kids how to ride the bus by the time they were 10 and I said get out of the house yeah. and uh, you know luckily um, I have married 23 years I have two generations so I have a 19 and a 17 year old which became um, best friends and, and definitely war machines against us parents that's a whole different discussion <laughs> um, thank god they've landed on their feet and then I have a 12-year-old daughter and an 8-year-old son. So um, they're close enough in age where I literally will lock them out of the house to go ride their bike and cross streets. And I'll never forget when my daughters were teens, 12 and 13. And I had a bunch of kids over at the house when I lived back in Wisconsin. This is so crazy. Um, I'm a free-range parent. I would tell them to go to the park, and we had a busy street in front of our house. You just look both ways, cross the street. Well, there's this one girl, and I always included the strange ones that nobody ever liked. Um, And my kids hated that, um, but I did, because I just, you know, I don't believe in exclusion, and I think bystanders are pretty much the demise of the planet anyway. So there was this girl, Um, She wanted to show off for the team of girls that were there. So she decided to play, it's an old 80s game, Frogger. Miss the car, right? Uh. So she was going to dart across the street to miss the car. Well, she didn't miss the car. She's 12 years old. The car hit her. She fell over the hood. And um, 
I called 911. She was fine. The motorist stopped. Her parents, of course, were both attorneys and were going to sue me for letting a 12-year-old cross the street by herself. Oh, jeez. I literally, you know, lost my mind and couldn't even comprehend the psychological makeup of adults that couldn't see that a 12 year old is really capable and should be at that age of crossing the street by themselves oh, yeah. so yeah I've, I've we've grown up in a twilight zone of crazies oh and my latest this this is this will just kill you. So my eight year old, you know how eight year old boys boys go. Well, they have this Christmas thing called Shelf on the Elf or Elf on the Shelf or whatever, where parents totally um, screw with the kids' minds to make them behave. Well, my son was over at his friend's house and told them that the Shelf on the Elf wasn't real because the little kid was afraid. He said, you don't have to worry about that shelf on the elf. It's not real. The mother went ballistic on my son. Why? Because he told, my son told the kid that the shelf on the elf wasn't real. Or the elf on the shelf, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I never heard of it. That's you know, right. I only heard of it just this past winter. So, I, I'm so still, I don't know what it is. So now, Now they can't play together. Because my son told his, her son that the shelf on the elf wasn't real. Isn't that amazing? And that's not the only experience I've had. Um, I had when my middle daughter was, I think, eight years old. We had missed a play date back in Wisconsin with a woman who had called me. The next day and I'd forgotten that we had a play date. It's not like I don't have kids and I'm not traveling all over the place and I'm not married or anything else like that and and don't volunteer. Um, she called me literally screaming that I had psychologically harmed her child and her child was crying all day because I missed this play date. And this is the majority of mommies and daddies out there today. I I you, kid you not. You're, you're talking about something that I, I read. No. Uh, okay, let's let's back up a little bit. I read something here not long ago where <coughs> there was a woman who was suing another woman because her child decided instead of going to this birthday party, they wanted to spend that day with their grandparents who were going out of town for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the uh, parents had to pay for, I think it was a uh, water slide or something along that line, um, they had to pay $15. Now this woman is suing the other woman for $15. Yes. It is that bad. It is that bad. Um, when my daughters, and that's why we escaped Wisconsin, because you're not landlocked in Florida. And um, when my daughters were, my eldest, were in 7th and 8th grade, Bayside Middle School was run by bullies. And it was me and another woman up against a bunch of ridiculous parents that didn't want to come in and teach children fair conflict resolve and how to get along. And um, there were, in effect, over the next, I'd say, until we got out of there, over 25 deaths, um, suicide-related, bully-related, to include parents, to include a couple kids as young as 10, all related to bullying in the North Shore. Um, you're not going to hear about that in the news because all of our leaders live there because it's an elite community. Uh, two blocks away, a child, um, oh, oh, we had a drug house across the street. That was great. Um, of course, the parents had money, so the cops never did anything about it. 
Um, the two blocks away one that I was talking about is very, very sad. This kid sniffed a bunch of Oxycontin and axe murdered his grandfather. Eesh. And um, the mother happened to be school teacher, is still a teacher at the middle school, who I befriended and, you know, but, and I tried to unite that community, and there's no uniting that community, and it comes down to the media, who has the biggest toys is the best, who keeps on the most perfect marriage appearance is the best. Oh, my God, the domestic violence in that community is just out of control, to include our crazy next-door neighbors, who, when we first moved in, their children were breaking in our windows and sitting on our couch and eating our food. And I literally took care of these kids because both parents were working and screaming at the kids, beating the kids, couldn't get along, um, and it was insanity. But the picket fence that they put on on the outside, these are the bully moms with all the gadgets and bells and whistles. Walk inside their home and you walk into a terrorist zone. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, you know... You have your inner city that has its problems, it's full frontal. Well, the secrets of the suburbs, my friend, are far more horrific than any ghetto I've been in. And we lived in a ghetto, so to speak, for 21 years, which was called the River West. And we thought, oh, moving to the suburbs, we'll have better school systems for our kids. No, I think I would have rather have stayed in the River West. <laughs> it was the worst move I could have made. It was right by the college, mostly college kids, and it was all socioeconomic backgrounds. And, um, yeah, they everybody fled. So, um, yeah, uh, I would never live in a suburb again. Hmm. Yeah, I can relate. I used to live in a suburb, a very affluent suburb of Chicago, for a number of years, and I moved into the city. <laughs> yeah. So... But, matter of fact, a lot of people I knew that moved out to the suburbs during the 80s, uh, during the urban, uh, I shouldn't say, yeah, not the urban, but the suburban expansion, they started moving back into the city in the late 1990s, early 2000s, because they were saying, hey, my kids are growing up, we still li still work and party in the city, so we, they mm -hmm. just, they sold the house, they sold the car, and they moved back into the city, and that's where they live. And actually, it turns out to be even financially better because they said, we have a place, we can get a subway or we can yeah. get a taxi or whatever straight to work, mm -hmm. and everything that we do is party. Here, that's work and party, good. right here. He says, we need to go to visit our friends in the suburbs. We'll go to, well, you guys are still living in the United States. You can go enterprise, rent a car, rent a car for the weekend, go visit your friends, bring it back, and back to the subway, taxis, and everything else. <laughs> Absolutely. I yeah. think city living is wonderful. Um, when we planned our escape from Wisconsin, because it just had gotten so toxic, it's no place for a woman. In fact, the CDC rates it as a D- minus for the health and economics of women. Um, we made a clear choice to move here to Florida, to Jupiter, um, basically because of the CDC rating for women's health and economics is an A+. So the health of any community is based on the baby makers, and it's just a fact. And um, you can go across the states, and you will find the ones that are in the most disparity are the ones where the women are the most oppressed. And once again, I'll go back to, it really isn't the man's fault, although they do a good job of keeping powerful women oppressed. Mm -hmm. It's the females. So, you know, um, it's just, it's terrible. And, and until we address this stuff, especially in the suburbs, the secrets of the suburbs, where, you know, really the entire United States of America's health rests, which is all about disappearing because they're hanging on to their pretend lives um, on Facebook um, or fake book. Um, until communities unify and, and really stop the bullying and the relational aggression on all aspects, not just females, with their kids, 
and stop putting up these stupid competitive picket fences and looking for some government to save them rather than compassion. Um, we're, we're doomed and bloodshed will be had. I mean, we're already passively being killed by the environment and by, um, you know, our negativity and the hate. Uh, it's just going to get worse. And you can't do anything about um, New York if you live in Wisconsin. You can do something about Wisconsin if you live in Wisconsin, but you're going to have to have team members there. Now, what I've noticed, the greatest difference in living in Florida is you really have like-minded, empowered people that are making differences within their community. And you don't, and there are other places like Colorado, places in Northern California, San Francisco's just been a country all of it in itself. And we could go on with, you know, healthier, <laughs> healthier communities. But um, uh, yeah, it, if if we don't stop in fighting with each other, it's going to get crazy. And everybody wonders why crime is so high and this and that. Well, it's because of you. Yeah. It's because of you. It's because of you and I. And I can't do anything about it when I'm one of ten people that show up at my school board meetings, which are entirely bully run um, and have business leaders on them instead of teachers um, to socially and career climb. I can't do, the 10 people that show up can't do anything about it. Well, let me ask you this question because we've had this conversation before about being active in your community, but also what you just got through talking about, just that, is that there are so many people that <clears throat> they still have their head in the sand. I was going to say something else more colorful, but... They have their head in their television sets. Well, yeah, that's the sand. That's what I'm talking about. In other okay. words, they are following what, and unfortunately, it's what the crowd says. The crowd says, let's follow this. The crowd says, let's follow Dr. Spock. Let's, the crowd says, let's follow Oprah. Let's follow somebody else. And it's always following somebody else. And then those who are uh, strong enough to stand on their own two feet and go, this is, yeah, you know, we, we get slammed down. Oh man, get, yeah, because uh, I didn't get my kids vaxxed. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Anytime you have to walk into a doctor's office and say you're not going to uh, sue the pharma corps or the doctors and sign that before your kid gets a shot in the ass, you you better think mm -hmm. there's something wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> so not kids are vaccinated they have caught nothing um, they've gone through the natural herd diseases and now of course it's declassified information that these vaccinations cause autism and all kinds of crazy stuff like chronic fatigue multiple sclerosis unidentified tumors and cancers you know really mm -hmm. so I, I can't believe how pariah I was by not only my own family, but by everybody else. Yeah, actually, it's kind of amazing because uh, even just talking about it on a health-related subject, I my brother is a little bit older than I am, and we were talking about health-related issues, and he says, well, you don't have this, you don't have that, and I went, no. And he went, well... You know, what is your doctor saying? I said, I only see a doctor about once every 20 years. Literally. Yeah. I'm not being yeah. figurative. Once every 20 yeah. years. And I, the last time I went to see a doctor was 2005, something like that. And I had a stroke. Didn't know it. And I walked into the doctor's office. It was behind the eye. It was looked like, to give it, I'm going to make this very short. Uh, I had what uh, looked like somebody had taken some cream or some yogurt and threw it, threw it right in the middle of my eye. In other words, I had peripheral vision, but I could not look at you in my right eye and see your face. I had to look to the side to see you. My left mm -hmm. eye was fine. So it didn't, there was no pain associated with it, nothing. Just looked like there's a yogurt stain right in my eye that I couldn't get rid of. So I'm thinking, okay, I've been eating too much junk food recently. 
maybe I should just go home and purge my system. So I did. That was on a Friday and Sunday. It wasn't any better. So I had my roommate take me to uh, what was called an urgent care. Uh, the only place I've ever seen that was in Arizona. So that's where I was living. So the doctor on uh, that was in the clinic at the time, he's a general practitioner, says, nah, I think you have a uh, detached retina. And I went, I doubt it, but okay. So he made an appointment with me to see a specialist, which I called my insurance company on Monday, and they said, no, you have to send, they sent me to somebody much better. The guy is an eye surgeon. So the guy surgeon, he and his team did the check on me. He says, no, you just got a blood clot behind your eye. Oh, okay. He says, there's no medication that we can give for you, so it'll either stay the same or it'll get better. I went, okay, yeah. fine. So I'm not fretting over this. I went back to work the following day because they had eye drops in my eye and they couldn't see anything anyway. So I started doing what I know because I'm a holistic therapist and because I said, nah, all I needed to know was what the problem was. Right. He wanted to see me in three months. I went back in three months. My vision was back to 2020. There was no blood splot. There's nothing in my eye. He checked it and he says, you're in the top 5%. And he ended up asking me what I did to get uh, get rid of the blood clot. And I told him and he said, he's going to go study. it." <laughs> 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 so well, was, like to, I would like to quote... Uh, my friend Michael Parenti. He is a recovering academic, Dr. Michael Parenti. And WISO is in your colleges. Um, they have very powerful CEO board driven um, curriculum, people that approve the curriculum. Information is withheld, and literally, medical students from on down um, are force fed information that isn't even true a lot of it so um, it's very sad that they're pumping out doctors that don't have the knowledge that they should well it all comes from the drug industry because even they come out and say look we're not in the business for curative they're only in there to to if you will assuage the 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 pain in mm -hmm. other words help you deal with the pain not to cure because if we cure you we lose our customers Correct. and that is what our medical professionals are being taught and it's very very sad because you can have east meets west easily like the silk road mm -hmm. um but it's just way too much money driven and uh pharmaceuticals and doctors kill more people than any street drug um and they don't mean to. You know, they're just, they're taught this way. Yep. And it's just a very sad thing. And, and when the public educates themselves, which they need to, and they stop sticking their head in the television set, which is micromanaged and they are programmed, we're going to have an, an awakening, which I already think we are. So there's there's so much to talk about but the, it, the main thing comes down to community unity people have got to be okay if you wear stripes if you you're green if you listen to black sabbath if you listen to dubstep whatever it is you do as long as you are kind and you make a mistake and you make it right and people are taught how to have conflict and and are able to have any kind of opinion they want without being judged for it it, you know, things are going to get better. But until until this right fighting and this infighting and this stuff stops and people are looking to the government to save them when they should look to each other to share, it's just going to get worse. And it's just history repeating. I'm sorry. You, st you said, uh, you know, people looking to government to save them. And I started into, and people already know, I'm, I'm a fairly decent fan, I wouldn't say I'm the biggest fan, but I'm a decent fan of George Carlin. And one well, of the things that he You talked, and me both, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that he was talking about was um, uh, electing officials or electing people to government. And he says, and you sit there and you complain about the government 
that's in power and you're the one who voted them in. You're the ones who are responsible. He says, what we're putting out is what, in other words, what we're getting is what we're putting out. So you're asking somebody to say you... They don't, huh? come, they don't fall from the sky. They don't come through a memory yeah. from some other spacious place. They come from American families who go to American schools who you vote into office, which isn't actually true anymore because our vote really kind of never counted. But, um, you know, again, he, I'm, I'm, I'm on, I was out at his dedication in New York for his sign, and I met his daughter, and we just, you know, didn't stop talking for about three hours. Um, very, you know, everybody's flawed, but this man was so anti-establishment and so spot on about everyone and everything. Um, definitely, and to include himself, he included himself in being yeah. an absolute lunatic, which I really appreciate because you know I'm just as crazy as the next person too. Yeah. But you and I both really share a love for someone that can speak such truth and deliver it. Um, Wow! Without even knowing that uh, you've actually been smacked upside the head. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, it's diplomatic enough where you can go. Uh, thank you, and then you realize later on, oh, he just insulted me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's very, very true. And I always talk about the baby boomers have who have really killed this planet, and they have. But yeah. there's also the other part of the boomers that have never lost the fight. But once again, they're the ten that show up. Mm-hmm. You know? The ten that show up with, you know, this young kid. They'd always call me the Gen Xer. I've been in networking groups and activist groups since I was about 13. And, you know, I've always been the youngest one by 15 to 20 years. And um, they've lost the fight because their counterparts left them and they have just as much disdain for their age group like George Carlin and Mm. we really got to and they don't care they don't care about their grandchildren they don't care about their children they're more worried about getting plastic surgery and running around the country to their golf tournaments building cabins, building mansions, rather than really taking a look at what society has done and what they were afforded. My generation doesn't get the pensions or the perks anymore. We're dying here, and they don't care, because it's theirs. Yep. And that sucks. So I've noticed a shift in the 80s kids that didn't turn into booms um, of us really making family with each other. My friends are my family. Yeah. Without them, you know, with the emotional support, sometimes financial support, all of those things, um, I wouldn't have made it through my rough spots. So we're kind of becoming tribal again. And it's very sad because a lot of my friends, after begging for help and begging their parents to pay attention to their grandchildren and do like the Depression era people did, um, which was retire and make sure that they were involved with their children, their families, and their communities. Um, these people are not retiring, and they're going out to make more money that they don't need, and they're basically chopping up their entire family, and then they get to the nursing homes where the government sucks up all the money that they made. Huh. Very and true. They, and then they wonder why their children don't come visit them, and they wonder why they don't have any grandchildren. Because in these times, the smart boom parents are really supporting. You have 75% of smart boom parents that are supporting us 80s kids and their grandchildren. They're not running off and getting ass implants and breast implants and face surgeries and going on their great little tour buses. No, they're actually enjoying watching the beautiful children grow up and making sure either the father or the mother is able to stay home. Those are the smart ones because that's where the beauty is at. Yeah, let me take you back to something I've been thinking about ever since you spoke about it and I have my own little version of putting it there. There was a nice little poster, it's only been up once that I've seen anyway. 
Uh, video games are what cause children to be violent, and huh? there's, there's a, then there's that picture of the Crusaders, and it says, what video games did they have? Right, right, right. So, <laughs> what, what do you feel about that? You know, put in your own words. Um, for about the Crusaders, what do you mean? You well, just violence in particular. I mean, oh, where does it originally? It, and where did I it originate? see video games, there being, even if you were talking about listening to different types of music, I see that to be as Who's a... It, well, I'm just saying, I see it as being in, as, as an example of our society, not so much the cause of it. Well, the booms are creating the stuff that the people are buying and then they're complaining about it so they're buying up the video games marketing it packaging it and putting it out just like sony and warner and all the movie houses are buying up all of these madonna bots and the you know the robin thicks and the justin beavers and you know producing them that's not music it's all auto-tune mics all your shows are fixed, like The Voice. They're all nepotized children that are on that show that just have changed names. And then you, you, you put in a few smatterings of, of other people, and that's the same as, it's the same as anything. Corporations, anything. Just imagine a little egg being incubated, and that's what they're brought up to be. It's nepotism. Mm-hmm. But the American public doesn't know it, and then it's all fake. Let me take you to a different area, something we weren't going to go to. We had never said that we wouldn't, but just the same. Um, there's these topics going on about um, President Obama. And the question, well, some people, they hate him. Or as a friend of mine used to say back in the 80s, he says, you, you love him or you love to hate him something mm -hmm. like that and there are people that love hate obama and then there are people that support him like yeah you know he is jesus christ in the white house you know <laughs> you know just using that as an analogy but there are people that are just they're on either side and then there are those of us in the middle are just going uh okay like for, for instance i put up this videos uh, part one of two i never listened to part two uh, but evidently this is where Rudy Giuliani was talking about Obama doesn't love the United States. He was that way when he was a kid, and what's her name? Whoopi Goldberg gets on there and says, ah, shut up, get Rudy, and all that kind of stuff. And one of, a friend of mine, or a Facebook friend, I should put it that way, because he's really not a friend. He's not an enemy, but he's not a friend. Um, is an acquaintance, put it that way. He's also a journalist, and he is one of those who apparently supports Obama in what he's doing. And all I'm saying is what I posted in post part one of Rudy Giuliani's spiel, spiel if you want to call it that, from last week was what he said. And the guy that had, uh, he took, how should we say, he didn't like what I posted he started talking about Rudy Giuliani's past and what he did and what he didn't do. And I want to say to this guy, but I just haven't gotten to it, it's just saying, can we talk about what he said, not what his past was about? What is the subject that he's talking about with Obama, and is it true or false? That's all I really wanted to address. But people want to take it on a personal basis, and it seems to be harming us in our plight to become better well no offense i think this is so immature because what he said is not what he said um it's his team and uh -huh. pe people are he's scripted he's been groomed for 20 years like the rest of them yeah um, people are playing for football teams that don't exist it is absolute theatrics like the wwf Mm -hmm. And no one man can possibly be responsible for all of this stuff that goes on. Yeah. It's called a shadow government, yeah. and it's a global mafia. So I just have to laugh when people are mad at Obama, because yeah. it's 
not Obama. It's a shadow government, and it's not his speech. He didn't write it. Mm -hmm. It's a team. It's kind of like when the new pope came in. I loved it because people were like, oh, he's so good. He's I'm like, honey, he's got 20 handlers. Guess what they did? They put him in a Jesus-like cloth, in a Jesus-like throne for a reason. And that was to make you think that he's this nice little little man that is this humble, poverty-stricken dude. Okay? That's for the poor dude. The Vatican could wipe out poverty in one day. Okay? So this is this is just theatrics. All of it. They work for a shadow government and it's a global mafia. And they all work for one thing. Money, power, and control. And they are literal narcissists. If you brain scan them, it would show on their brain scan. And it's from American multi inbreeding and nepotism. So the seven deadly sins are upon us. So it's not Obama. It's not his speech. It's the mm-hmm. shadow government. So these these fights that you see amongst the political teams are hilarious. Yeah. Because it's not true. It's like watching Russell Brand go on all these um, shows. First of all, if he was actually legit, they wouldn't have him on these main name shows. True it's theatrics. Hannity is supposed to be this big, you know, conservative dude who has some ex-drug addict comedian who pretends he's for the people, yet... Um, lives the high life and, and when people try to ask him where he his money goes from his book he you know uh, doesn't tell you and then I love it when he rails on Apple where which you know it's all globalization made overseas by little kids where nets are stuck out of windows because they're caned they can't work for 16 hours they pee their pants and they try to kill themselves by jumping out the window so he's railing on Apple and he uses an Apple commu- computer, but now he's got a true sticker for the Apple. Now, granted, he's making people think. That's about it. But he's one of them. So people need to wake up, and again, it comes down to community unity. And, and fighting for these football teams, it's a bunch of theatrics. Yeah. Just to distract you. Because if, yeah. the, public, if the public actually localized in their community got their local governments and school boards under control and everything else and made it a very nice place to live. Then they went after their state, and if every state was under control, guess who would be taken out next? The feds. But, you know, I just don't see it happening that way. Unfortunately, I don't either, and this is what I was just going to ask you, is just uh, how can we get a community together when we have those people that are buying into you can't let your kids play out on the street by themselves you have to take them on a play date you have to take them to yes. Chuck E. Cheese you have to take them to a gym you have to take them to yes. a swimming pool yes. they can't go swimming in a pool they can't go swimming in a lake they can't ride a bike down the street you know, the most they can do is ride a skateboard that's big these very, days very very gently because um, people are scared and you can't attack people's wounds you know people are very scared they're scared for many reasons so what I do in my community is I am active in it I'm active within the school systems and there are a group of parents in rising number that are learning to raise free-range kids that ride to each other's homes Um, so it's it's very gently because these people are afraid, and what happens when you attack somebody's wound? They get aggressive. So it doesn't work that way. But if somebody is aggressive, I definitely will directly put them in their place. And we have to make people aware of people's personality disorders as well. Because we all come with a certain neurosis, and one of the most stealth forms is passive aggressiveness. And it's a killer. And that's what America hums and rolls. So until we know and can detect passive-aggressive people, leaders, everything else like that, and we know how to legitimately speak with them, to corner them, um, they will end up in a narcissistic rage and their mouth will be pulled. 
So, but that is an art form. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm thinking about my last visit to the United States, and it's just like uh, people ask me, so when are you going to come back? And I said, probably never. <laughs> <laughs> And they couldn't quite understand why, and I'm just listening to you talking about it, and I'm just going, never, no probably any more to it, never. Right. <laughs> there are a lot of people that are moving to different countries that are really um, striving to be social democracies. And, you know, again, they're not perfect, but no. you can actually live and enjoy well, even when I came here, people asked me, says, what do you think about the crime here? And I said, there's crime everywhere in the world. The right. point, basically, when you're moving, and you understand this because you travel around the world all the time, is you have to accept that there is crime everywhere in the world. There's no place on the Not planet. Is here. America loves to scare the shit out of us about every other country, when in fact we are the most barbaric country on this planet, with the most mm. random violence. With my experience, I agree with you 100%. But as I was telling them, I said, you have to understand that there's crime everywhere in the world. It's just you have to choose which level of crime that you're willing to deal with. Down I, here where I live, the crime here, yeah, it exists. But it doesn't affect me. Right. And unless I go looking for it, it doesn't come to me. Right. And I, and I love our, our, you know, attacking of the Muslims. And you go to legitimate media, like, say, in Paris, where they have the no-go zones. So, unfortunately, um, many journalists that I do know um, are being assassinated, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And um, it's pretty horrific, of course. Um, you know, the public understand that either because they have their heads in the TV sets here um, the funniest thing is when uh, a few journalists went down to no-go zone and they're talking to the Parisians who are sitting with the Muslims in cafes and shopping with them. And, you know, the words that stuck out to me is when they are asking these kids, and they're of all different nationalities, black, white, Asian, Muslim, that live mm -hmm. peacefully in these supposed no-go zones. And uh, the one woman says... I'm sorry. And, it's just, you know, it's just um, crazy. And they are. And until we stop watching the industry and stop watching the TV and unite in our communities to really relearn history and help each other without judgment and be really careful about people's wounds, you know, um, it's just we're, we're just headed for bloodshed. Mm -hmm. And that's just the nature of the cycle. I hope it can be prevented. Uh, I well, if you listen to, and I know you said you did, my uh, podcast from last week. It's what I was talking about. Is I just don't feel that we're going to avoid it. I think that now have your comments on this one is fine. It's no problem with me um, because I like. I like conversation. I like to have that conversation. That's why I was talking about what Rudy Giuliani said about Obama. Yeah, it may be scripted. That's fine. I saw him reading it anyway. It wasn't like it just came from his heart. He just knows how to say it with emotion. But the point I was saying with the guy who was arguing against me was, where's the dialogue? You're just supporting uh, Obama, but where's the dialogue? In other words, can we talk about this? Can we discuss it? Can we come to some mutual understanding? Maybe you know something I don't know. Maybe right. I know something you don't know. Let's right. put it together and see what we can come and make out of it instead of just blindly supporting him and somebody else who is blindly just saying he's the worst dog out there in the street. You know, The thinking you knowers. Well, first of all, people have to realize that this is a soap opera that's scripted. And then when they realize that, then they, they've really got to go relearn um, how our Constitution was ripped from us completely. We think we're free. We've never been free. And, you know, we have to learn that this is a soap opera first. Yeah. And it really is. And, um, and until we can actually fundamentally get to that level of thinking, and again, community unity and agreeing to disagree. So what? You want your football team? Have that football team. 
Okay, you have your football team, but how about we concentrate on solutions? Mm -hmm. How yeah. about we do that? How about Kathy down the block? She's oh seven years old and she's ailing. She's got grandchildren that she can't really take care of. Well, let's get together for a meeting in our community and see how we can share and help with the responsibilities, not only of the children, but the elderly that live alone. Mm -hmm. so, so how about we do that? So how about we go to the school systems, which are really jail systems and, you know, um, feeders for our for-profit uh, jail systems now, which most people don't understand that our jails are for-profit. Um, let's do that instead. And let's not, let's not fight. Do I really care who is the best or worst dressed on the Oscars? Why do these people deserve my attention? Um, I, I feel sorry for them because most of them are definitely MK Ultra program and trauma based. One, and, and secondly, they're just grotesque human beings. You, so, you sh go ahead. I'm sorry. I got a point I'm going to bring up. <laughs> so I just, you know, the, it just back to the same thing. Let's start stop fighting and let's start with the solutions. How about that? And the only solutions we're going to have is by knocking on our neighbor's door and not judging them. We can stay away from politics, religion, and let's just go to the solution and the welfare of the community as a whole. Please don't judge me because I have pink hair and a tattoo in the middle of my forehead if that's what I want to do. That doesn't mean I am a satanic evil person because, you know, you want to, you know, quote Corinthians all day. How about we just base each other on normal ethics and actions. Hmm. After what you just got saying, I'm not sure I want to actually bring up this subject. We'll see how it goes. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, well, I guess I, since I opened my mouth about it, I might as well just say it. It's, uh, one of my favorite authors is Gore Vidal. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the man has passed but I love the man's books because even as he put it, and what really drew me into his books was that he says, I write on history, but history is boring. He says, what makes my books novels are is that they are historically correct, except I put in the conversations that could have existed. We have no proof that this conversation actually existed, but history is just a, 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 a account of nothing but facts. Is it really? Or is it just storytelling with well, maybe let's some... Well, put it this way. As he, yeah, as he put it, he says, I come from the elite class of the world. And he says, for me to tell this history as we know it, because most people don't understand there is what is known within the royal and the elite classes is history that is more or less the true account more so than anything else and then there's the history that is taught to the public okay people don't understand that and i've said it before and i'm quite sure there's quite a few people that just go ah uh, yeah right sure okay but if you if you ever go look for it you'll find it but anyway Gore Vidal says, I have betrayed to a certain degree this trust that I've been told that, you know, this is the history that is and what everybody else is told is, you know, it's, it's been doctored. And, but he uh, puts in the conversation to make the books a novel. In other words, we, we can't prove it, but from the facts that we have, these are the possible conversations that went on with his book. So it's actually a very, very interesting way to learn history uh, and to be, if you like to be entertained, if you want to read the book for whatever, very good. And one of the books that he wrote, uh, Julian, uh, the last uh, of the family, I forget which family it comes from, but he was the last legitimate Caesar of his family, of his family lineage. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who was trying to, before Christianity really overran everything in Rome, uh, he was the one who was telling <laughs> everybody that, yes, you can have your own religion, that's okay, just pay tribute to Rome. 
and even though he was a staunch Hellenist or Mithraism, uh, one who practiced Mithraism. Oh, Mithraism's awesome. I yeah. love that. I love mythology because that's all spirituality and religion is, yeah. pretty much. And he made the statement, and I still have the book, and I don't remember what page it's on, like, because anybody's going to really go check on it. But he was talking about how Christianity was absorbing so much of Mithraism and Hellenism and other religions along that line. And he made the comment in there that he says, maybe this is how Mithraism will actually get spread to the population. Because if you know what Catholicism is, uh, Catholicism is a Latin word that just means universal. <laughs> well, it is. And, you know, man screwed religion, no matter what it is. I've read the Koran probably six or seven times, and it's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they all say the same things. It's all stories. And you and I, both being Jewish, we call the Torah the Stora. Um, we uh, conservatives and reformists, Juda Judaism like, um, find our spiritual books divinely inspired by intelligent beings, but they're stories to learn and live by, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So God is left up to you. If if I want to believe that God is a pewter frog, then that's that's okay. Just as mm -hmm. long as I live within these certain ethics, and that's why the high holidays are so important to me because I can reflect, emotionally develop, and there's so many paths to that. Journaling is is definitely one of mine. Oh, yeah, man. Wow, did I really narc out on that one. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you, you learn. You move forward. And these religions, like Christianity, is, they're so filled with shame. And it's awful for the human psyche and produces the most demented form of human being I have ever met. Mm-hmm. You know, and Muslim is just the baby religion. Yeah. So, I'm with you. Yeah. What what I was getting at here was in with Gore Gor Vidal when he's talking about this, how Julian was saying, well, maybe this is how Mithraism will actually spread. And we're talking about Catholicism, and you know, the early church wasn't called the Catholic Church; it became the Catholic Church after many years of infiltrating into the Roman government, which after it did all that, it fell. But uh, the word Catholic, or Catholic, it just means universal, which is kind of funny because people says, well, I don't like the Catholic religion down in Mexico because it tends to be more, um, more Mexican and they've got so many this and so many of that. And I said, what's the problem? The word is Catholic, it's universal. I used to go with a friend of mine to uh, DePaul University, and one of the classes, it was a comparative religion class. Never heard of that mm -hmm. when I was in college. The Catholic priest came into the room and says, well, and he explained Catholicism means, and he made a list on the board, literally, of all the religions that he took, that, that Catholicism took uh, part of. They said, he says, we took the best of all of these religions and made it into the Catholic religion. Okay, I'm not trying to talk anybody out of Catholicism or out of Christianity, but the point basically here is, it's what I'm actually drawing in on is, is like Project Paperclip from after World War II, where they took all of these scientists and they made them into part of the government. I mean, that was mm -hmm. Von Braun, who, uh, you know, helped with the space program. Uh, as a matter of fact, I lived oh, in the same city as him for a long time. Never met him. Holy, huh? Holy moly. The what? The human experiments. The oh, human yeah. experiments haven't stopped today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But you got me thinking about that when you said MK Ultra because it's that was one of the key components that came from Project, Project Paperclip. Right, PSYOPs. Yeah. So and it goes on today. Yeah. And we, and we have an underground trafficking of organs done by the government that are, are given to rich people that have drank their liver to death. Oh, yeah. As being the recipients of one of those underground trafficked uh, missing children on the street. Ugh. We could go on and on about that. Oh, yeah. Indeed. <laughs> but we are coming up on uh, this is about an hour, 20 minutes. So. <laughs> 
the, did you want to continue on? Did you want to wrap it up? I think uh, wrap it up. It? Okay. And for those who are listening to this pro- this podcast, Melanie has agreed to come on the show live on Blog Talk. We will be booking her fairly soon. I'm not sure if it would oh. be March or April, but we'll work it out somewhere down the line. Melanie's always traveling someplace in the world. I mean, you're sitting up here talking to her and going, well, I'm in Switzerland this week, and I've got <laughs> where she is half the time. So. <laughs> but we'll get her when she's available. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, Melanie, I'm really, really grateful that you came here. Uh, it was wonderful talking to you again. And uh, next show we'll do, we'll definitely have to stop the... <laughs> the preamble <laughs> talking you know, we spoke for about half an hour 45 minutes before we actually started recording this yeah well, but we have such great such fun talking with each other so yeah. it is wonderful to have her on and just to, uh-huh. to talk with her thank so, you very much any, yeah most definitely so uh where's your next jaunt off into the universe wherever you're going this time or do you know yet? Going to London actually in June, but I do have a few um, American trips I to make to solidify stuff. But um, after June, my travels will be finished because I have um, resigned from my company, and um, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> well, we still have a project that we were talking about, so we'll, we'll do that. And I'm definitely um, open to uh-huh. and, and, you know, it's really been an honor. I've got um, agents who don't like me very much because I've got a book out there that um, is set to be published. So they're arguing with me about the name and a couple of them. Uh-huh. So, um, but other than that, um, I, I don't know. I definitely need a break. <laughs> mm, yeah. But with my personality, I don't not do. You. I doubt it (laughs) with all the things that you do I think if you found some free spots you want to fill it up with something so yeah that's okay and I don't mean that on a negative point (laughs) I think it takes my mind off of me yeah well before you go tell us a little bit about your women's empowerment um, that you were talking about at the beginning you were also involved with the community and all that kind of stuff so tell us a little bit about that before we go Sure. I run a women's empowerment magazine online that's called City Gal. And back in Wisconsin, from about 2006 to 2009, it was the most popular magazine. And um, that's when the economic housing market and everything else crashed, so it took kind of a dive. And then I started taking on different projects around the world. And... um, I still kept it going online, and it's something that I really want to restart, and um, I I still do it on Facebook, and we still have occasional um, writers that I put on our website, so it's to empower empower women, and our main goal is to really raise the the new feminist flag as um, to combat relational aggression. Uh, another couple magazines that I would like to start underneath that would be a men's magazine, which we do have the startings of, and um, a third and under magazine. And hmm. what makes City Gal so unique is we have uh, all different representations of women, from a stay-at-home mother to a working mother to lesbians to um, and and they you know, write about their topics. Then we have all different kinds of spiritual spirituality that write on their topics, and then we all have different businesses. And one of our mainstays is also politics, in which um, we had local senators, a Democrat senator and a Republican senator, that we would choose a topic for, and then they would go back and forth on. So um, it's really a one-size-fits-all. You can find anything, and you can peek in on everybody's kind of stuff. So, and so, where can people find that? Um, at cigal dot com, and it's it's spelled like it sounds: c i t y g a l dot com. And um, it's a little bit dormant now, but uh, we're gonna get things going again. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're figuring how out how to you know restructure. 
sounds to make it all inclusive. Yeah, it's a good thing. So you don't want to let it die. Just okay. Take a breather and regroup and yeah, that's come back out better than ever. That's my passion, and then I want to go back go back to um, adapting rock operas to stage, which I did for oh, 20 years, and yeah. worked with some amazing people, and I have some amazing people that really want to put some uh, prolific concept albums to stage. So those are the other two little things that I wanted that I really want to get back to. So cool. besides that, my family. So there you go. All right, dear. Thank you very much for being here, and thank you to our audience for being here. And we hope that you'll keep up with us both at Blog Talk Radio and here on the blog. And we'll see you again in the near future. Take care and be well. Thanks, Kirk. Thank you for being a part of our listening audience. Be sure to keep up with our shows and our podcast via our blog on Twitter, and in Facebook. All links, including our RSS feed, are available at kwave6radio.tk. That's kwave6, the number 6, radio.tk. All the best.